to lecture 11. In this lecture, we will introduce a new type of random variable. It is called the sum of independent Poisson trials. This random variable can be considered as a generalization of the binomial random variable bin and p. After that, we will look at the chain of bounds corresponding to this random variable. We will first give a tighter form, and then after that, we will give the weaker form. The weaker form is made it is because it is easier to remember. Let's start. Okay, so first of all, let us review what is a binomial random variable. Suppose that x is a binomial random variable with parameter n and p. So this random variable can be considered as the sum of n independent indicators, i, p, so that the parameter is p. So briefly speaking, it corresponds to n trials. Each trial has success probability p, and then for each trial, we will, we, will, we will look at whether it is success or fail, and then we count the total number of successes among all these n trials. Each of these trial or each of these indicator is called a Bernoulli trial. So if we make generalization on it, so this time, again, we have altogether n trials. But then for each of the trial, the success probability can be different. So for instance, the first trial succeeds with probability p1, the second one succeeds with probability p2, and so on and so forth. All these trials, all these coin flips, they are independent of each other. If we count the total number of trials such that it is successful, then this is the sum of independent trials. And each of these trials, we call it Poisson trials. So we are looking at the sum of independent Poisson trials. Okay, now given this, this one, so we can let x be the sum of these n independent Poisson trials and each of the Poisson trial you can represent it as a random variable xi or xj okay such that for the j indicator the j trial the chance that xj is equal to one successful event is equal to pj so in that case x the big x will be equal to the sum of x1, x2, x3, up to xn. We let mu to denote the expected value of x. So we can easily get this result. This is by the linearity of expectation. The expected of x is equal to the sum of the individual expectation of the variable xi. So we will have expected of x is equal to p1 plus p2 plus p3 up to pn. And this expected value, as we define here, it is equal to mu. So we use mu to represent the expected value because we want to make the formula that we introduce later shorter. Okay, now let us take a look of the moment generating function of the random variable x that we have studied here. So we let mx with the parameter t to be the moment generating function of x. Then we get this result. For any real value t, the moment generating function is less than, so this is a function, it is less than or equal to e to the power mu times e to the power t minus 1. So we have this result. So this is a function of t, and this is also a function of t. It means that, so we say that this function is less than or equal to this function. It means that for each value of t, the left-hand side is smaller than or equal to the right-hand side. So let's see how we get this result. So the proof is actually very simple. It comes from the definition. So first of all, before we compute mxt, let us also define mxjt. So mxjt represents the moment generating function of the of the indicator xj because all these xj values they are independent of each other and x is the sum of them so the moment generating function of x 
is equal to the product of the individual moment generating function of these indicators. So for a particular indicator xj, the moment generating function will be equal to, so, so the moment generating function, as we recall, it is the expected value of e to the power txj. So with probability pj, the value of xj is 1, so that with probability pj, it will be multiplied by e to the power t. And with the remaining probability 1 minus pj, the xj value will be 0. So with probability 1 minus pj, this term will be multiplied by e to the power t times 0, which is e to the power 0, which is equal to 1. So this term is simply by definition of the moment generating function. And now this is a product of this, this term, and for this term it has plus and minus there. So it means that it is rather difficult to multiply these many terms together. So what we are going to do here is we want to make an approximation. So this value, you can consider it to be written as in the form of 1 plus y. So there's a 1 here, and the remaining plot is plus y. And then we know that 1 plus y is less than or equal to e to the power y for any real value y. So in that case, we make an approximation so that this is going to be less than or equal to e to the power the remaining part. So for the remaining part, it is minus pj plus pj times e to the power t. So after doing some algebraic operations, we get that this is simplified to be pj multiplied by e to the power t minus 1. So, so this is the product of all these terms together. So, so we can further simplify this, so this is equal to e to the power, so we, every time we have e to the power t minus 1. So one term is multiplied with p1, one term is multiplied by p2, and so on and so forth. So in the end, when you multiply them all together, so we get p1 plus p2 plus p3 up to pn, so we will get mu here as, as, a, as a result. So in other words, we have proven a theorem. So the moment generating function of x is less than or equal to this term e to the power mu et minus 1. We want to get the churn of bounds, so the moment generating function is needed. So that's why we have this theorem. And now let us take a look of the churn of bounds. So the churn of bounds, we have two two cases. One is bounding the probability of the right tail, and the other is bounding the probability of the left tail. So let's do the right tail first. So this is the main theorem. Let x to be the sum of n independent Poisson trials, and then for each trial, x, so the j trial will have successful probability pj. Mu is the expected value of x. Then for any delta greater than 0, the chance that x is more than or equal to 1 plus delta times mu, so it is like delta mu away from the mean value. So this is about the probability that is far away on the, on the right hand side of, of the mean. Then this will be less than or equal to this this term. This term is e to the power delta divided by 1 plus delta to the power 1 plus delta, the whole term to the power mu. Okay, so let's see how we can obtain this bound. So we will rely on the results that we have already known from the last lecture. So the churn of bounds for probability of x greater than or equal to 1 plus delta to the power mu will be less than or equal to the moment generating function divided by e to the power t of this term, 1 plus delta mu. And because the moment generating function is further less than or equal to this term, so in the end, by using the churn of bounds that we have studied before, this probability that we want to find is less than or equal to e to the power mu et minus 1 this term divided by 
e to the power t 1 plus delta mu. And this holds for any t greater than 0. So if we choose a suitable t, in particular, we choose t to be equal to log of 1 plus delta, then we get the result on the previous page. So let's see. So you have e to the power delta. So let's see. So this is e to the power e t minus 1. e t minus 1 is equal to 1 plus delta minus 1. So it's delta. So where is the mu? The mu is here. The mu is here. So you have e delta mu. Okay. And here you have e delta mu. And for this one, the bottom part, e to the power t is e to the power log of 1 plus delta, so it is 1 plus delta. So you have 1 plus delta to the power 1 plus delta times mu. So again, we have something here. So this is just by using our bound on the moment generating function and also the chain of bounds. And then after that, we substitute t to be equal to a specific value, then we get the result. But then you may wonder why we choose t to be equal to log of 1 plus delta. Yeah, why do we choose t to be equal to 1 plus delta, log of 1 plus delta? You can choose t to be 1. You can choose t to be 0 0.5. It also works. But then we choose this. It is because it will give us the best possible bound. It will give us the bound that minimizes this term. As we recall, the smaller this term, the more accurate that we are claiming. Now, in order to get the smallest possible bound for this one, it is the same as we want to get the smallest possible bound of log of this one. Okay, If a number is large, the log value of that number is large. If a number is small, the log value of the number is small. So we want to minimize this. We want to minimize the log of this one. So the log of this one is mu times e to the power t minus 1 and then minus t times 1 plus delta times mu. Now, because mu is a constant, it's an average value, it is a constant, it doesn't change with respect to t. So in order to minimize this term, it is the same as we minimize this function of t, which is e to the power t minus 1, and then minus t times 1 plus delta. Okay, so this is our function of t, now, by using differentiation, if you look back, so if we differentiate once and twice, this is what we get. And we see that the double derivative of this function f is equal to e to the power t, and it is greater than 0. So that means what? That means that this function f is going to be a function that the first drops, and then and then maybe it achieves minimum and then rises again. So in order to get the minimal value of f of t, we want to find a case such that f prime t is equal to 0. And the f prime t is equal to 0, it happens when t is equal to log of 1 plus delta. So this is how we obtain the special t to plug in the channel of bound. Okay. And similarly, we can obtain the churn of bound of the left tail. So this time, we want to find out what is the bound for the probability of x less than or equal to, this time, it is 1 minus delta instead of 1 plus delta. So 1 minus delta times mu. And it turns out that the, the bound here is very, very similar as before, except that all the plus delta is now changed to minus delta. So it is e to the power minus delta divided by 1 minus delta to the power min 1 minus delta to the power mu. Okay, again, we apply the channel of bounds that we have. So we have this probability is less than or equal to, this is the bound for the moment generating function, divided by e to the power t 1 minus delta mu. So we get this one. And we need to be careful for this time, we can only choose t to be less than 0 to plug in. But as before, by plugging it with the special t equals to log of 1 minus delta, we get the formula from the pre previous page. And again, why we want to choose t to be equal to log of 1 minus delta? It is because we want to get the best bound for this one. 
And in order to get the best bound for this one, we want to get the best bound for the log of this one. And this is the value of the log of this one divided by mu. Okay, so because mu is a constant, so this is like this. And again, if we can minimize this one, then we are done. And it turns out that the, the minimum value that we achieve will be when t is equal to log of 1 minus delta. So this is the end of the first part.